Uh, I want to introduce Robin Gerber. She is the author of Leadership, the Eleanor Roosevelt Way, um, Timeless Strategies of the First Lady of Courage. That's a great title. And then Catherine Graham, The Leadership Journey of an American Icon. Her books are used widely in leadership courses and programs around the country. She speaks regularly to corporate, government, and university audiences. She appears on radio programs, NPR, talk shows, and others, and writes for newspapers and magazines. Uh, before she became an author, she practiced law in Washington, D.C., and worked on Capitol Hill. So she's going to be speaking about Eleanor Roosevelt. Let's welcome Robin Gerber. engineered that break for everybody. <laughs> and the second introduction is my specialty, not really. Um, I'm, I'm so honored to follow you, Don, that beautiful and moving talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back from the long line in the ladies' room. We'll be liberating the men's room later. We'll <laughs> be sharing it at least. Right. <laughs> Just over a week ago, we were riveted by Christine Blasey Ford sitting in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, sometimes in a trembling but powerful and moving voice, speaking of her abuse by Brett Kavanaugh. And then something extraordinary happened. And I'm not talking about the so-called FBI investigation. <laughs> Now, thousands of women, thousands of women called hotlines, sexual abuse hotlines, and domestic violence shelter. And thousands more who we don't even know about talked for the first time about their abuse to their friends and their family. She gave them voice. They gave her power. We are each other's voice. We are each other's courage and inspiration, and we move each other to action. And you know, that's what Eleanor Roosevelt and all the great women activists who came to Washington during the New Deal, that's what they did too. John did a beautiful job of letting us know what a human being Eleanor was. We think of her today as, as an icon. How could anyone be like Eleanor Roosevelt? But the truth is, she was not a saint. She wasn't a superhero. She was as scared and insecure as all of us. And there was a woman, and John introduced her, Marie Sylvester. Sylvester. It was a woman and a woman's voice that gave us Eleanor. I would argue, John, that but for Marie Sylvester, there would be no Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a little more about how that journey started for her. It was in 1899 when she boarded the ship that took her across the sea to Allenswood School. At that point, she wrote in her diary, I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of mice and the dark and being alone and other people and being buried alive. Of course, she was afraid of death. Her mother had died when she was eight. Her littlest brother died the next year. And then her beloved and flawed father died of his addictions and alcoholism. <coughs> and she went to live in this very severe but chaotic house of Grandmother Hall, where she had four adult aunts and uncles. And when she was 14, her friend Laura Chandler White came over to visit her and she said, Eleanor, what are those three big locks doing on your bedroom door? And she said, they're there to keep my uncles out. We don't know if she was sexually abused. Uh, research would tell us that she was a prime candidate. What we do know is that she was put on that boat to go to Allenswood to meet Marie Subest, who was the headmistress of the school. And she was something, someone so wonderful. She was a daughter of the French Enlightenment. Her father had been a famous novelist and philosopher. She was a Breton from Brittany. 
She was in uh, religion, an atheist. She was in love, a lesbian. In politics, well, she was living in England and railing against the Boer War in 1899. <laughs> she was a Dreyfusard, unafraid, as Eleanor saw, to confront the anti-Semites who would rally against Dreyfus, those people who would later, and in not too long a time, become Nazis. She was, she embraced the settlement house movement and helped build housing for workers. In fact, she left what money she had when she died to build worker housing. And she embraced Eleanor, this sickly, scared, insecure child. She saw a light in her. And she introduced her to a wonderful education and to the world. With Mademoiselle, you could not parrot back what you heard from her. Oh, no, you had better write original ideas, or she would stand in front of the group of 25 or so girls, and she'd rip your paper to shreds. She taught her to be an original thinker. And she traveled with her. When she took her to Paris, <coughs> sorry, Eleanor had arrived dressed by her grandmother in clothes like an eight-year-old child, but Mademoiselle took her to Paris and bought her her first French gown. Eleanor said later, this was my favorite gown for my entire life. She took her to Florence and said, explore the city on your own, unchaperoned. I've seen it many times, go. This was unheard of in her grandmother's world. And so she taught her to be <coughs> curious and free and about French cuisine because Mademoiselle was a great gourmet and French culture and politics. And by the time she returned to New York three years later, she was a changed young woman. She still was prone to depression. And while she might have enjoyed fun, she was a bit over serious. And when she got back, well, she was going to be caught up in that social world because she was a debutante. And Marie wrote to her and said, please don't be seduced by, by society. Remember what you're about. And so she heard about this new organization. A woman named Mary Harriman was one of the founders. Wealthy young women were going into the Bowery to work with immigrant children to teach them calisthenics and dance. It was called the Junior League. <laughs> and Eleanor said, I'm going to join them. And she did, and she went down to the Rivington Street settlement and she wrote in her diary, for all the teas and balls that I'm going to, the best part of my day is in the Bowery. And of course, she reconnected with her cousin Franklin. And they fell deeply in love. He wrote to his mother, one of the first things he wrote was, Cousin Eleanor has a very fine mind. And so they talked and talked. And one day she said to him, come with me down to the Bowery. One of my children is sick. I'd like to take you to their tenement apartment. And so he goes with her, and they go up to this airless, unsanitary, crowded, horrible spot. And I'm sure many of you have seen these tenements. And when they came out, Franklin turned to her, and he said, my god, I didn't know people lived like this. At that moment, the greatest political partnership in our history was started. And in that moment, you can see a direct line from Marie Souvet's voice to Eleanor to Franklin and the taproot of the New Deal. Flash forward to 1933, January. Eleanor's in Washington. Franklin's going to be inaugurated, of course, on March 7th. And she's walking across Lafayette Park with her great friend, Lorena Hickok, who was a newspaper reporter. And she says to her, my God, I never want to be a president's wife. And I don't want to be one now. What was she going to do, redecorate, hold teas? Yeah. Pick new china? No. She had to find a way to live her moral purpose through this job, to have her voice come through to women most concerned about women. And so she goes to a publisher and says, you know, I'd like to write a book. A few <laughs> academics in the crowd here, right? You'll appreciate this. She says, yeah, I'd like to write a book about 40,000 words, and I want to bring it out in two months. 
<laughs> time for the election. Um, and there was no ghostwriting, by the way, for Eleanor. No, she wrote everything herself. And so she does. She writes this book, and she aims it at the women of America. And some of it is, after all, it's the Depression, how to feed your family with very little money, how to raise your children. But then, then, she talks about how you shouldn't be afraid as a woman to go out and work, that we should be free to do that, and support unions, and boycott businesses that aren't doing the right thing, and get involved in politics. If we could ignite the civic duty of women, she believes that will change the country. And she calls the book, It's Up to the Women. You can still get it, and when you read it, you can see she's talking to herself, too. It's up to me, it's up to all of us. It's kind of manifesto. And of course, she doesn't stop there, no. Lorena has another suggestion for her. She says, you know, Eleanor, how about having press, a press conference? No first lady had ever done that. And just invite the women reporters. <laughs> and... Eleanor thinks, well, yes, this is right. I want to speak to the women. The women reporters will translate what I have to say in the best possible way. And so she schedules this press conference for the Indian Treaty Room three days before Franklin's first press conference. <laughs> she loved that story. <laughs> and she's, you know, she's kind of nervous because she's doing something no one's done before. So she brings a box of candy and the the women come in and there's not enough seats, so some of them have to sit on the floor. And the men are watching from the door and they say, oh, look at them, they're just a bunch of docile news hens. This isn't gonna last a month. And Eleanor offers a piece of candy as people come in and the ice is broken. And well, those news conferences lasted the entire time that she was in Washington. She held 368 of them, almost one a week to get her message out. And she said to those women reporters, you must speak to the women in America about politics, about policy, about what's happening here in Washington. Of course, she also wrote. Her voice came through her writing. She had a column in McCall's magazine. Listen to what she titled the very first column. I want you to write to me. That was the title. You think she was getting a few letters? It was the Depression. That month she got 300,000 letters because she said, write to me about your problems, of course, but also tell me what you think we should do because we don't know everything here in Washington. She gave them her voice and they gave her their voice back. You all know she wrote my day too, six days a week for 26 years after she left the White House. Again. Eleanor's voice reaching out across the country, creating a movement, a movement for women at the time of the New Deal. But of course this was Eleanor. And she never did anything alone. Blanche Wiesen Cook likes, likes to say she did things with a gang. And so she did, and a very important member of that gang was Molly Dusen. Now Molly Dusen had been a social welfare worker as well, uh, superintendent for parole for girls in Massachusetts. But Eleanor tapped her when she was 54 years old. She <coughs> tapped her in 1928 to come and organize women for Al Smith's unsuccessful presidential campaign. And she was a natural. She was just a natural at politics. She was a natural at getting people to work with her, at organizing at strategy, political strategy, and every national campaign after that, it was Molly Dusen who was organizing the women activists. She was called America's first female political boss. And Molly comes to Washington in 1933. She's head of the women's division, to be appointed to the women's division in the Democratic National Committee. <clears throat> and she and Eleanor cook up an idea. They have a powerful idea. It's patronage. For women. Because at that time, well, you know, a good sized dining room table could have fitted the women who had high level positions in Washington, D.C. Now, of course, Molly, and I don't want to take anything away from Kirsten's talk, but Molly was the force behind getting Frances Perkins appointed. 
And I'll let Kirsten talk about that, but let me say this, that Frances Perkins, our first woman cabinet member, labor secretary, it wasn't just about getting Frances in that job, although she was absolutely the most qualified person in the country for that job. It was the idea that if a woman could be a cabinet member, then a woman could be on the Supreme Court and an ambassador and another cabinet member and in every high level position in the country. And so in the middle of April, 1933, Eleanor and Molly and Nellie Taylor Ross, who had been governor of Wyoming, was about to be director of the Mint, first women director. And Susan Shelton White, who was a feminist suffragist lawyer from Tennessee, they sat down together and they said, how are we gonna do this and we better get going because the men are already taking the positions. <laughs> but there's a big opening here, the poverty, the despair, the fear in the country, it also created a huge opening. All these new programs, all the change that was happening, the door could be open for women, they knew it. There could be a new deal for women. And so they think, well, how should we do this? Let's, let's pick a hundred women. Let's start with a hundred. That was a big number, considering there were only 12 that had high level positions. And let's really work on the first 15 or so and get those appointed. And Molly's gonna go and talk to Jim Harley, the, uh, Jim Farley, sorry, the head of the Democratic National Committee. And she thinks, and they say, well, you know, Farley can get this done in a morning. This is nothing. And she goes to talk to him and he says, absolutely, I'll, you know, I'll take care of this for you. The next morning comes, and the next morning, and that, <coughs> it's not happening. It's middle of July, seven women have been appointed, really? Molly is not happy. She writes to, to Farley, she says, heads you win, tails I lose. She writes to Eleanor and she says, even the most, even the nicest of men can be slippery as eels. <laughs> she gets to November, there's still not enough appointments in her opinion. She writes to Eleanor again, I feel like the Jewish wailing wall. <laughs> wailing for all these forgotten women. But she is working tirelessly. She never gets back to her hotel room at the Mayflower till 11 o'clock at night. She says it's like a bag of cats, every, every position that she wins. But slowly, slowly, she is winning. 6,000 women postmasters get appointed across the country. Molly wants a woman Democrat from every state to be appointed in Washington. And then she wants appointments to go to the states for women to give out in the states to build their power there. She gets three women aviators appointed to the Bureau of Air Commerce. It was up to the women, and they did it. Over 100 women were appointed during the New Deal, during, almost during that first year. And no longer could you just sit them at a dining room table. You needed a hall like this. Well, of course, Eleanor was helping in every way she could. Sometimes she'd invite Molly to dinner with Franklin and Molly could get things done before the soup course was over. <laughs> and Eleanor was working on, as we know, many, many projects. Arthur Dale, the community in um, Appalachia, was her great, her baby. And even though it didn't <coughs> succeed in the way that they had hoped, nevertheless, what Eleanor said when she was criticized about how it, it didn't work out and didn't get people reemployed and didn't, build this thriving community. She said, you know what? Those people know this. In their poverty and despair and fear, they know this, that the government didn't forget them, that we tried. And of course, she pushed very hard for the National Youth Administration, always very concerned about young people, and that happened. She pushed for everything from the packing horse <coughs> librarians who were a group of women in uh, rural Kentucky who got on horses and mules and rode through the mud and the sleet to little towns and communities to bring them reading material, books and magazines that, where they had none. She championed that and she championed the she 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 that's hard to say. She 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 camps of the Civilian Conservation Corps. <laughs> Eleanor led by her presence 
by showing up. And John talked about it. She was everywhere, famously down in the coal mines where women weren't supposed to go. In Puerto Rico, with some of her women reporters to highlight the poverty there. In the fields here in California, in the slums. She was all over, and of course she got criticized for it. Because she was doing what she wasn't supposed to be doing. What first lady had ever done this? She was supposed to be home with her poor handicapped husband. That's what, that's what her detractors said. She was called Eleanor everywhere. <laughs> Supposedly a man named a clock after her because it never stopped running. <laughs> and Alicia, <clears throat> Alicia Patterson, who was uh, the Republican owner of the Washington Times newspaper, well, one day she ran a banner headline, I mean above the fold, giant letters saying, announcing, First Lady Sleeps in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor led by her presence, by bringing her voice to women all over the country. She said, every time we shirk taking action or making up our minds, it weakens our spirit and our ability to be fearless. As the New Deal was coming to a close in 1939, she was swept into the greatest, one of the greatest moments in civil rights history. A moment of fearlessness and a moment that illustrates another great way that she led. It was the spring of 1939 and Howard University in Washington, D.C., the historically black college, was having a fundraiser and they had invited the greatest contralto singer in the world, Marian Anderson. Toscanini said a voice like hers comes along once in a century. And she had sung in Buckingham Palace in the White House. And they wanted her to sing in the best venue in Washington, which was the Daughters of the American Revolution, Constitution Hall. And then those days, by the way, it had a glass ceiling. You could look up at the stars <laughs> if you listen to the concert. But the uh, DAR said to the officials at Howard, no, no, you, you can't. Uh, we can't have Marian Anderson. We don't allow black performers, or integrated audiences, for that matter. And so the officials at Howard, well, they knew who to go to first. Because again, as John said, Eleanor had been a great champion of civil rights throughout the 30s. Friends with Mary McLeod Bethune, Walter White, the head of the NAACP, having them into the White House, which of course was criticized. Working on behalf of the one piece of federal legislation that the NAACP wanted, the one piece that was never passed, a federal anti-lynching law, because black Americans were still being hung from trees in this country then and later. She worked on that and so many issues that when this happened, the officials at Howard got in touch with Ellen. And she was furious. First of all, they didn't know this. She was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. As you know, John, your family goes back <laughs> to the revolution. But she also was very aware of this, as so many Americans were that only months before, in November of 1938 in Germany, Hitler had incited the German people to smash Jewish homes and businesses. Jews were arrested and killed in a terrible time we call Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. And all over the world there was an outcry about this. This was the first time we really, the world really saw the face of fascism. And there were, criticism of Hitler all over the world in American newspapers. And he said, well, wait a second. Don't criticize me. Look at how you treat blacks in your country. And so there was a keen awareness that our democracy had to be above reproach. And so Eleanor wrote a letter to the DAR. She said, I am resigning my membership because you have failed to lead when you had the chance. And then she sent that letter to newspapers all over the country. <laughs> and all over the world, there was an outcry about why is the First Lady involving herself in this? 
but she did. There was a committee put together by Howard, she was a part of it, and they arranged a place for Marian Anderton to sing. On Easter Sunday, 1939, she stood at the top of the steps of the Lincoln Memorial with that great statue behind her. She was wearing a full-length gown and a full-length mink coat, grand piano next to her. And she said later that as she looked out, she wasn't sure she'd be able to sing because on the mall in Washington, there were 75,000 people, black and white together. And she stepped to the microphone and she sang, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, to thee we sing. People who were there said it was the greatest moment of their life. But here from Eleanor is another example of her leadership because she didn't go to the concert. <coughs> Why not? Because if she had, well, she would have been the focus of all the attention. And instead, of course, that moment has belonged to Marian Anderson. And more than that, she gave Marian Anderson a new kind of voice, because she had not been political. And this awakened in her a much greater understanding of what her role must be in civil rights. Leaders empower others to lead, and that's what Eleanor did that day. Well, we must find our voice too today. We must give our voice to each other. Eleanor said, we don't become heroes overnight, just a step at a time. Finding strength and courage and confidence every time we look fear in the face. If you're not afraid, well, you're not paying attention. <laughs> But we can find that courage in each other. We can find that <clears throat> action within ourselves. And Eleanor was such a great person of action and inspired action in others. She said, courage is more exhilarating than fear. With that courage, with that exhilaration, we can again ignite a new deal. Thank you.